uh, ran a Corvair repair shop for 40 some years and uh, been around a few Corvairs my life, my whole life. So uh, it's been fun. Tonight, though, we are going to talk about storing a car. And uh, as Jeanette said, that it's not just a seasonal or uh, geographical thing. Oh, you guys in the north, you got to put your cars away for the winter. And we're in sunny Southern California. We never put them away. But you know what? Things happen where cars get stored. You see it all the time. You know, you look in your club newsletter, a car for sale uh, hasn't been run in five years years or, you know, cars for sale, ran when parked. When was that? How many decades ago was that? So a lot of cars get parked and you never know. Uh, you know, you think, all right, I'm just going to put this away from, uh, let's see, I think probably the first week of December, it gets really cold, I'll probably get a little snow then, and uh, ah, we'll be all over by yeah, the end of March. So the car is only going to sit for about five months and we'll be good. Well, you know what? Most of the time, the cars that don't come out of storage, something happened. And it can be any number of things. It could be your health. It could be health of somebody in your family. There could be other family issues. There could be a job change. Now, all of a sudden, you got to drop what you're doing, move everything. And hey, getting the Corvair out in spring, uh, you know what? That's kind of low on the list of priorities. And, you know, time marches on, waits for nobody and the car keeps sitting and there's now, you know, there's more important things. There's a jillion reasons that could happen, things that could happen that weren't in your initial plan. And now you're one of those guys that's got the ad out, a uh, car for sale, last ran 10 years ago. And, you know, it wouldn't even start now if you wanted to do it. So if a car is properly prepared, you can minimize the amount of effort it will take to get the car going again when it is started back up. And uh, also minimize the damage that you can cause by trying to start it. Now, we're not gonna get real involved in talking about how to take your car out of storage. That's a whole different session. And in fact, we have recorded one of doing that. We had a ramp side that was parked for at least 15 years, probably longer. And we did a, a complete session on how to uh, properly start up that vehicle after that long-term storage. That's being edited right now. The filming is already shot. So on our, our next uh, meeting, uh, we'll get that uh, user link out to you for the, that particular video. But tonight we're gonna talk about what you should do in preparation for storing your car, okay? So the first thing before you even put the car away is with the car uh, fully warmed up, go ahead and do an oil change on it. Why do you want to do that? Because with the engine fully warmed up, you're going to have all the moisture uh, should be uh, dissipated within the engine. And you want to drain that all out, get the old oil out, get the moisture out, get the acidity that may be out. Don't just do it cold. That's not, that's not going to help us get rid of the moisture and stuff in the engine. You want to get it uh, with the engine fully warmed up and take off. Obviously, you're going to have the oil cap off when you pour in the new oil. If you see moisture around the oil fill cap, because that's where it's going to collect, is the highest point on the engine. Make sure you wipe that all off. The bottom side of the air cleaner lid where your crankcase vent tube exits out, if it's got moisture, wipe that off. Try and get all the moisture out of the engine itself. And then go ahead and uh, finish your oil change, start the engine up, let the oil circulate a little bit. So that's step number one of doing it. Now, we're gonna talk about a couple different areas. So they're not necessarily, you don't have to do them in a particular order, but we'll just do it in the order it's on my bench, okay? So the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna need to do something with the battery, okay? And again, Maybe you're thinking it's only going to sit for those four months during inclement weather, but you never know. So uh, the first thing you want to do is always disconnect a battery cable. It doesn't matter which one you disconnect, the negative or the positive. Just disconnect the battery cable, and you could just let that battery sit like that with the battery cable disconnected. It's really important to disconnect the cable for two reasons is one is 
If you've got any kind of aftermarket radio in it, it's undoubtedly got a, a tuner in it with uh, electronic tuner or a clock. Any kind of aftermarket radio has a constant draw on it. And uh, if you leave your battery connected, your battery is going to go dead in about a month or sooner. And once it's dead, if you don't get it charged up right away, uh, you know, come even if it was a new battery, if you had it uh, connected up with a aftermarket radio in the car, when you went to start it in five months, that battery would be flat dead. And I don't think there'd be any hope of recharging it. You know, fortunately, you might have a warranty to go back and say, oh, I don't know what happened to it. It just doesn't work anymore. But whatever. So disconnect the battery cable. Okay. Now, I would highly recommend a battery maintainer. Battery maintainer is not a battery charger. If your battery's flat dead and you hook up a battery maintainer, it's still going to be flat dead. It's not the maintainer's job to charge up a battery that's dead. What it does do is keep a battery that is already charged, keep it at that fully charged rate. So I've had very good luck with battery chargers over the year with a few caveats. Uh, you know, the, the price of the maintainers is all over the board. You can go over to Harbor Freight, I mean Harbor Freight, and pick up a, a cheap one, especially if you got one of the coupons, they're like $5.99. And uh, ah, they're okay. But with those really inexpensive uh, battery maintainers, like the Harbor Freight one, they've got one LED light on them that tells you that it's connected up. But the problem with the heart, with the single LED one is, I'll just plug this in, our little power there, and it lit up. Okay, let me turn the light off here so you can see that it's, it's on dimly, but that's as good as it gets. Okay, so we got a little light on the, uh, the battery maintainer that says it's powered up. I'm unplugging it now so the light went off. Now also, I'll connect up my cables, my output of this battery charger to my battery. Okay. I had this apart before. So I'm going to show you how to do something on here. This isn't lighting up like I expected it to do. Let's go to the other one. We have a brand new one here. This is also the same model, same battery charger, maintainer. I shouldn't use that word charger. Okay, there you go. This has got a real bright LED on this one, brand new one. Here's the problem with the cheap battery maintainers like this. Right now, the light is on. Does that tell you it's working? Well, guess what? I don't even have it plugged in yet. Okay, so if you're looking at that, you say, oh, well, how could that be? Well, this isn't a very smart battery charger because it's low priced. And you have to be really careful about these with making sure that everything is plugged in on both ends. Because if we had our battery maintainer plugged in the wall, our light is on. Okay, but it's not connected to the battery, it's not charging anything. And likewise, if somebody unplugged this to plug something else in, or maybe somebody pulled the cord and it came out of the wall, any number of things where the AC power is disrupted to this, now this becomes a drain for the battery. So you think you're doing the battery favor by keeping it maintained? <laughs> It's draining the battery by running this LED. It'll take a while. It may take a month or so, but every minute that's on, it's draining a little more power out of the battery. And you think, damn, I had this thing all plugged in. It should have been charged. And then you look and you go, oh, well, it wasn't plugged in. So there you go. So be very careful about if you have, you know, one of these inexpensive battery maintainers with this one LED on it, because if it is, uh, on, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's charging. So what I always do, I connect up the 
power supply here. I got so many power supplies, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'll plug it. I'll plug it in the wall. I'll make sure my light is on. There we are. I'll make sure our light is on. And then I will follow the yellow brick road. Here we are. <laughs> wow, it's fine. Wait, too many chargers here. It's all plugged up, plugged in. Make sure the power's on. Then I'll connect up the battery, unplug it, make sure it's still on. So test it both ways to make sure it is actually connected up and charging. That's the only way you can tell it's one of these. Now, if you spend a little more money, more than the $6 on the on sale item, you can get a better one. This is from a different company. They're, they're, they're all out there on it. If you look on eBay or any of the other, Amazon, everything, it's all kinds of battery maintainers. Uh, the better one is one with two LEDs on it because it has one for power, AC power, so that you know that the AC is working. And then when we connect it up to the battery, now our other one comes on and tells you it's charging. Now, after the battery does reach its proper voltage, the green light will go off. So you know that the uh, battery is up to snuff where it should be. But uh, this is a much better indicator. When you first hook it up, you'll, it'll always charge for a moment when you first hook it up. And uh, you can tell right away that, okay, yeah, it's connected at both ends. It's connected at the battery and it's connected at the, uh, the wall outlet. So that's a little better grade. And that would be handy to have. And you can spend even more money and get something like this. This battery maintainer, nice long cord, so your car can be a little bit away from the outlet. So I'm just going to connect this one up. Okay, this one happens to be a uh, extreme max products unit. And this one is either six or 12 volts. So if you have some other collector cars that might be six volt, it's okay to work on that. And this one figures out, you know, what, what you've got. So I'm gonna plug it in. And the first thing it does, it tells us what the voltage is. So in this case, our battery's sitting at 12.5 volts, okay? And then when I go into mode, I can select if it's a motorcycle battery, or I can select if it's a passenger car battery, or I can go along to a, uh, uh, a storage mode. And also uh, it'll figure out whether you got a six or a 12 volt battery. So I'm gonna put it on the passenger car mode because that's the kind of battery it is. And it's going to try and charge it to 13.2 volts. That's its goal to charge it. And it's got a little graph on here with uh, four lines inside the battery. Right now there's only two on. So that means it's going to be charging the battery until it gets to that 13.3 uh, volts or so. So that's a, a much better charger. Uh, you can just pretty much plug it in and walk away from it and it'll keep the battery maintained to that degree. It's more expensive. You know, it costs probably, this is probably a, I bought it a while ago. I don't know what they're up to now. It's probably a $50 battery maintainer, okay? And the other one was a five or $6 battery maintainer. Uh, but they're, you know, this one's kind of foolproof. If we accidentally unplugged it, everything turns off. We're not discharging the battery by trying to power up this as we are with the cheap Harbor Freight one. So that's uh, an advantage with the more expensive units. Uh, one thing I did find out also about the uh, Harbor Freight unit, I've got this powered up right now. What I did is I took the cover off, the plastic cover. It just uh, pried off of here because it has happened to me. I've got battery maintainers on all my cars. It has happened to me. I pulled the car out and I forgot to unplug the battery maintainer. So 
it usually rips the cord out of the battery maintainer. Uh, so I've had to solder this on, or I have run over the power supply. I mean, it happens when you got a lot of cars, the battery maintainers sometimes then do that. So what I did find though, is these early battery maintainers, a part of freight, I turn on my, my voltmeter here. And I put a cigarette lighter plug on this one so I didn't have to open the hood all the time. I can just connect up the cigarette lighter plug to the uh, car, charge it that way. Okay, so with my volts on here, but voltmeter, you can see that our output of the battery maintainer is only 12.18. That's not much more than a marginally charged battery. Okay, this battery, I haven't charged it in a while. Let's see where it, it itself is at. 12.69 or so. The amount you want to have a battery maintainer be at is typically in the range of 13.25 to 13 and a half volts. That's or you want a fully charged battery uh, in normal room temperature, you'll see it'll be about 13 and a half volts, 1325, 13 and a half. On these early <clears throat> battery maintainers of Harbor Freight, they've actually got a little potentiometer on it here where we can adjust the voltage. So I'm just gonna take my screwdriver. I've got my voltmeter connected up here to the output of this, and I'm gonna see how high I can get this, if I can tweak it up any, 24, 25, 12, 25, 12, 24, let's go back the other way, 12, 17, 12, 25, that's not great. It's better than it was, but I wouldn't consider this a really good battery maintainer because it really doesn't have sufficient voltage uh, to get it up where you want, want it to be. So on, like I say, on these, uh, these cheap Harbor Freight ones, they're kind of hit and miss. And on the later ones, like our new one here, they change their design. So if you've got one where the LED is in the far corner, it's got the adjustable pot on it. If you've got a later one with the LED more in the middle, okay, there's no adjustment of this. Whatever it is, is the kind of voltage it makes. So let's just see how many volts. This is a brand new one I just opened up. Let's see what kind of volts it's at. Because what I'm telling you to do is check the voltage. If you've got one of these, check the voltage of it, see what it's at. If it's one like this one, where it's only like 12.25 volts, I'd take it back. Tell them it doesn't work because that's not really going to give you the kind of charge you want. Now, this one, on the other hand, this one is at 14.17. That's kind of high. That's kind of hot. That's not really a battery maintainer that you want to leave on the battery, you know, for, for a year, because I think that's going to be a little strong and uh, may overcharge the battery. So your sweet spot is right at that 1325, 1350 volts. So uh, check, check your uh, battery maintainer voltage, see what the output is, because you don't want it too high. And of course, if it's too low, it's not really going to maintain the battery. So that's a little discussion about battery maintainers. Most important, like I said, take the battery cable off when you store it for two reasons. One is so you don't get a drain from anything on the car. Second is in case you get a dead short in the car. Uh, that's not a big problem on Corvairs. I have seen it quite a bit on other cars, especially, uh, you know, cars from the 50s where they've got the cloth wiring harness. Uh, it's not plastic covered, but the cloth covered. Uh, you can have uh, mice problems, and we'll get into that, uh, where they like to eat on the wires and uh, chomp up that insulation. 
And uh, that's also kind of a problem on newer cars uh, where they're using the uh, a different type of uh, insulating material on there that, the, that actually attracts the rodents and stuff to it. Anyway, if you get a dead short on that, while that battery's connected up, you could end up with a fire, okay? Wiring harness get red hot, start to smoke, and uh, you can have a fire uh, caused by a dead short. You don't want that because you're not gonna be there to see it. All you're gonna do is come home to the garage, burn down to nothing with a car with it. So leave one of the battery posts disconnected while uh, uh, the car's in storage. You can hook the battery maintainer right up to the post to keep the battery up, uh, but leave the car disconnected so there's no possible drain from the car. What about taking the battery in the house somewhere? You know what? I don't think I'd bother, you know, really. Uh, as long as you've got a battery maintainer on it, it doesn't matter whether it's 50 degrees outside or 15 below. As long as the battery's got a full charge, it'll be fine. I wouldn't bother to take it out uh, and, and bring it in the house so you can trip over it in the house, you know, just leave it in the car, just as long as it's disconnected and you got a maintainer on it. So that's my thoughts on a battery. Next down the line. Let's, uh, Shelly, can you bring our, Shelly, my wife Shelly is our camera lady tonight. Uh, would you bring the uh, unit down to the other end of the Corvair, please? Mm -hmm. The number one biggest problem of storing a car that I have found is that fuel problem. And that happens on every single kind of car, doesn't matter what it is, that the fuel goes bad. Fuel is like a loaf of bread, okay? When it's fresh, it's great. And after not too long, it starts to degrade. Okay, it doesn't become so fresh anymore. And you can you can put it in the freezer, okay? You can doctor it up, you can put some stable and stuff in there and make it last longer, but it's never as good. You take it out of the, the uh, refrigerator and uh, you defrost it. And that loaf of bread is never as good as it was the day it was baked. And the same is for gas. Uh, gasoline starts to deteriorate the instant you put it uh, in the tank. Uh, and the worst thing about it, it turns into like a tar, tarish type stuff. It's all the light stuff in the gas kind of evaporates off and you're left with the goo. And that's what's in the bottom of the gas tanks on cars that have sat for so long. And uh, <clears throat> you should never, ever try and start a car with old gas in it. If you can smell the gas and you say, ooh, this gas is ancient, don't try and start the car with it. You're, you're asking for big problems. Not only are you gonna plug up fuel system parts like the carburetor, fuel pump, but with all the light stuff of the gas uh, evaporated out, uh, you're just running that heavy part of it through the engine. Uh, it makes deposits on the valve guides and causes the valves to seize in the guides. So you'll get that you might get the car started and it'll run, you get it all warmed up, says, eh, look at this, it's been sitting five years, this thing runs like a million bucks. You turn the car off, you come back to it an hour, you try and start it, and you start and start it, and it's it sounds terrible. The, the compression is all off. And if you do get it started, it's popping and backfiring. Well, it's because it's got stuck valves, and now you probably have some bent push rods. So never start an engine with really old gas in it. If it's a year old, you're okay. Two years old, you're pushing your luck. Anything after that, do not start it with the old fuel. Okay. Some people have always said, fill your tank up before you put the car in storage because that way you, there's no place for any moisture to gather in there. I don't think that at all for a couple of reasons. One is, Again, like we talked about before, are you really absolutely positively for sure gonna start this thing up and drive it in six months? Stuff happens. So cars sit with a tank full of that old crap gas in there. <clears throat> and then if the system develops a leak, the gas tank gets a leak, a hose rots out, 
all of a sudden you got a gas leak. Now, what's going to be more of a problem? A gas tank with 14 gallons of gas in it leaking out or one with no gas in it? No, pretty obvious. So from both the safety standpoint and the uncertainty of it, I prefer to have as little gas in the car as is possible. And how do I accomplish that? Well, take off my gas cap here. From all the various cars that I've had and worked on, I've got an electric fuel pump here that came off a customer's car. You know, we had the session on electric fuel pumps, and this was on a car. This is a uh, high volume Holly, Holly rotary vein pump, which is a good pump, but it's really noisy. You know, I mean, you wouldn't want that on a daily driver car. So that's where I took it off of that car. And I put a, a quieter gear rotor pump on it. But this was a good pump, and I thought, well, I'm not going to throw that away. This will make a fine transfer pump. So that's what I did. I just bolted it to a plate. I put on a cord with a couple of alligator clips. I put on some hose. I got a fuel filter going in before the pump itself because we don't want to have any debris going into the pump. Got a fairly long flex hose. And I put a little metal tip on the end of that hose. And I'll tell you what. So first I'm going to straighten out the hose. I'm going to slip it down here. You can feel the point at which you get to the end of the neck and start to enter the tank because it'll hang up just a little bit right there. And if I twist it a little bit, it'll go, go past it. And I'll push it down until I can both feel in the hose and hear that metal piece hit the bottom of the tank. Hear that? Okay, we're at the bottom of the tank right there. So I'm going to pull it out and see how much gas we get. Not that much, only a couple of gallons. So that's not a lot. We're at the end of the filler neck. Give it a little twist, a little further. Right there, end of the tank. Now you notice the other end of my hose here. I've got connected to a Corvair fuel line, the one that goes into the fuel pump. So I also use this for test engines when I want to start up a, an engine uh, on the floor or something, or in a car that has had old gas in it. So I don't use the fuel that's in the car itself, but go to an uh, outside source so I can uh, prime up the system. So I'm just going to put that in our collector and uh, connect up our battery. We're going to power up the pump. There we go. Our pump's going. And we are pumping fuel. So that's what I do on my cars before I store them. I connect up my pump. I empty the tank out as much as will come out by this method. Now, when you're doing this, if you saw that you had like that much fuel in the tank, you're probably going to fill up this five gallon container. So don't like walk away and go get a Coke while you're pumping in here and all of a sudden your plastic bottle is filled up and now you're starting to spread gas all over the floor. Bad idea. So just stick around here while we're pumping the tank out so that we don't uh, accidentally overflow our little collection box here. So another thing, now Ed Thompson, you had sent me a, a question about uh, uh, your car specific to the fuel systems. And Ed told me that he's got a very nice 66 uh, Monza sports sedan, which I've worked on for uh, quite some number of years. And he says, I've, I've got about a quarter, it shows on the gas gauge, about a quarter tank of gas. And uh, I hardly drove the car this summer. So I actually bought that gas the year before, uh, but I put, put some stable in it. Um, can I just, uh, put a little more stable in it now and uh, you know, will it be okay for the winter? So the short question is, well, Ed, if you're absolutely certain that you're going to uh, get that car out next spring and drive it, uh, yes, you'll probably be okay. Uh, but I'll caution that you've already got some gas in there that's over a year old, okay? It's been doctored up a bit with 
uh, uh, some stable. And uh, now you're gonna pour the sleeve, put a little more stable in there. And then come springtime, you're probably gonna go to the gas station and uh, fill it up the rest of the way with new gas. So you got, you know, X amount new gas, X amount old gas, X amount uh, some stable. You know, you really don't have a fresh tank of gas in there. So uh, it's not the most ideal situation. And that's why I prefer to empty the tank out. See, we just got dribbles coming out of here right now. And this, the tone of our pump changed. It's no longer laboring. So I'm going to disconnect it. Close my hose. And we're not showing any gas on here anymore. So we've emptied out our tank almost to the bottom. Okay, as much as we can get out with our our, uh, our pump assembly here. And uh, now when I go to start that car up come springtime, I have to put some new gas in it because there is no gas in the car. So that's one way to make sure you get fresh gas when you start it up is that empty out as much as you can, and then come springtime, go ahead and uh, put in your new fresh gas. And uh, the old gas I took out, put that in the daily driver now. Get rid of it, use it up before it gets too old. Okay, so you're not really throwing that gas away. Use it in something else that you're gonna use up right away. So that, that's my recommendation. And now, if a fuel line uh, starts to get soft and have a leak, or the gas tank springs a leak, we're dealing with a much smaller quantity of fuel, okay? Any gas leak is a problem in an in inside area, big problem. But you can imagine if we have a gas leak, with a full tank of gas, and uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't come in that garage for a day or two and you open up that door, whew, bad news, bad news. So uh, as least gas as possible when it's stored. And again, in case, something life intervened and we didn't get that car out the next year or maybe the year after or maybe the year after at least the tank is pretty much empty and we're not going to be looking at a, a gas tank that's just filled with dew you know and that that'll be yeah, new tank time for sure so that's my thought on fuel while we're up here pointing in this direction Next thing is tires, okay? Your car is gonna be stationary, it's not gonna be moved. Again, for most situations where we're gonna park the car for a couple of months, uh, I would simply inflate the tires to the maximum PSI, it says on the tire. Most of them are in the middle 30s range, you know, 36 pounds, 38 pounds. There are some tires, which uh, will take uh, maximum inflation is, you know, 40 something, lower 40s. Uh, but most of them are in, in that higher 30s. I would inflate them to the max it says on the sidewall because you're trying to avoid a flat spot. Obviously the tire is sitting in one spot all the time, all the load is on one side and they will get flat spots if they sit long enough. And the lower the tire pressure is, the worse it's gonna happen. Now. You could, if you have them, get one of the skates that go underneath your tires. Of course, you got to jack the car up, you know, and then set the skate down and slide the skate underneath it. And that can help you with two things. First off, it's kind of rounded. It's not going to do the exact contour of your tire, but it's going to be much better than a flat surface. And of course, it will give you the ability to smooth the car around. Now that it's going to be in storage, you want to try and get the car in a position in the garage where it's going to be least in the way of hazard. So maybe you want to get it all the way against the wall. It's hard to maneuver it uh, by backing it back and forth. You can use a floor jack, a little tricky. But with these skates, a set of four there, underneath there, you can push the car by yourself. You can even turn it around, put it sideways in your garage. Uh, you can do lots of things to maneuver, it's easy. And uh, with the contour of the skate here, it will uh, help keep the tire a little bit more round. Now, should you be ultimately concerned 
about the tire. Well, what I would do is I would look and see how old your tires are. And uh, this is common information, but I still run across a lot of people that say, well, I don't know how to tell how old it is. It's very easy. On the side of the tire, I kind of highlighted one for you here. <clears throat> On the side of the tire is its serial number. It has a dot number here and it goes in. And then at the very end, there is a number that's kind of encircled. It's in either a circle or a, or a rectangle. And if the tire was made in the year 2000 or newer, it has four numbers on it. The first two numbers, and this particular tire is 06, followed by 07. The first two are the week, and the second two are the year. So an 06 tire would, meant it was made in the sixth week of the year 2007, okay? Tires, remember I told you about that loaf of bread? Tires are just like that too. Uh, they're fresh when they come out of the mold, but they have, have a certain shelf life. No tire manufacturer warrants their tire for any reason after it has turned six years old. Okay, so once the tires turn six years old, you got a problem with it, the tire manufacturer is going to say, hey, you need to get a new tire. You, 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 you're at the life, the expected lifespan of a tire. And I know there's lots of quarter people driving around with tires that are five, six, 10, even 20 years old. And uh, you may look and say, I've hardly driven these things. They've only got about 3,000 miles on them. They look like new. Well, you know what? They also have the grip of a tire made out of Bakelite. I mean, they, they lose their grip when they get, they get old. They just aren't soft anymore. And the most uh, important thing is, uh, especially on the radial tires, bias is not as bad. But radial tires, which almost all of us have now, uh, the tread will separate. And I've had numerous people, uh, and some of you listening surely have had experience with tread separation. And when that happens, uh, you are very lucky if you get the car stopped before the tread flies off and uh, destroys your wheelhouse chrome, sometimes the fender, certainly some of the paint around the tire or around the wheel opening. Uh, beyond the cost of the tire, suddenly, uh, the flat tire has caused you four or $500 or more in body damage. And uh, that was it's going to be totally predictable if you have an old tire. So what's my rule of thumb? Most cars, our Corvairs, are used as hobby cars. We're not taking them on real long trips in, in hot weather. Sometimes we do. I go to the convention every year. I drive my Corvair. I'm on the highway you know, 75 miles an hour for as many hours as it takes to get there. So I make sure that my tires, you know, on the outside, because the cars are inside, so they're not getting ultraviolet, uh, you know, sun radiation, uh, which, you know, hardens the rubber and stuff. On the outside, 10 years, if you've got tires over 10 years old, you know, they'll be good to hold the car up during the winter, but I don't think I'd want to drive on them anymore. Uh, because they're just not reliable. So if you look at your tires and they're already 10 years old, you don't got to do any of this stuff as far as storage. They're already no good. So as long as they hold air so the car stays up off the ground, that's all they're good for at this point. So I wouldn't bother with anything special doing with the tire. But if you got some new tires, you might think about uh, you know having something that's more contoured than the floor, inflating them up to the maximum pressure. Uh, if you want to get really involved, if this is going to be a known longer term storage, I would jack up the car and place uh, the car on some jack stands so that the suspension is hanging so you don't have any weight on the springs and of course none on the tires. But again, the tires still age just like that loaf of bread, they're still going to age. So if the car sits there for 10 years and you get it out, so oh, great. These tires are great. They're just like new. Well, those are not. They're 10 years old. So let's keep that 10-year-old thing in mind. 
Now, I told you about these tires made since 2000 have the four numbers. I still have gotten, when I was fixing the cars in the shop here, many cars came in. Here's our dot number, and here's our rectangle on here. And inside of it, there's only three numbers. Now, this one isn't highlighted, it's punched in, and it says, Two, five, two. What's that mean? It's not four numbers. This tire was made before the year 2000 because back then in the uh, 80s and 90s, the manufacturer said, huh, nobody's ever going to keep a tire more than 10 years. We don't need to date that. <clears throat> so this tire, 25 is our week, and the number two is the year. Could it be 92? Maybe. Could it be 82? Maybe. We don't know. But if your tire has only three numbers, <laughs> it's, good. it's a good tire for the museum. You don't want it on your car. Sometimes you can tell by the, the, uh, the type of white wall it has or the brand it is. Uh, you know, this is kind of an off the wall brand. What is it? An elite. Well, no, it's a Lee. It's a Lee tire. Uh, I've seen cars with a a Goodyear Arriva on them. You know, they had a nice big wide one inch wide white wall on the Arriva. Man, those things, they quit making those in the late 80s. Anytime I see a car with that on there, that's a show car. It comes in and out of the trailer. It looks great on there, but they shouldn't be driving that on the road. So three numbers, bad. Four numbers, it'll tell you exactly the year the tire was made. And by the way, that full number is usually only on one side of the tire. If it's a white wall tire, it's pretty much always on the back side. Uh, some very new tires have the production date on both sides, but generally speaking, it's only on one side, which means to check it, you probably are going to have to get underneath the car with a flashlight. You may have to move the tire to, to get it to the right spot where you can see it. But, uh, you know, do check your tire date because a lot of us don't really know how old's a tire. And just because you just bought them last year, that doesn't mean they were made last year. Where was that tire sitting in some tire dealer's shelf up on the rack for two years? It could be older than you think. So it's good to know how old your tires are. Again, if they're, if they're anywhere like 10 years old, you better plan on getting new ones when that car comes out of storage because you don't want those on the car uh, to be on the road. So, all right, let's talk about Let's talk about mice. Mice are a big problem. And I don't need to tell you that because you've all gotten cars that uh, we would consider having had a mouse house in them. So our, uh, our biggest deal is to keep the mice out. Uh, mice are going to cause a huge amount of damage if they get in. And it can be other critters too, but mice are the most common. So there's all sorts of stuff that we know about. There's the actual good old fashioned mouse trick. Okay, that works fine. The only problem is you got to check it pretty regular to make sure that uh, it hasn't already caught somebody because if it did, it's served its purpose. Now you got to, you know, reload it or get a new one. Uh, so you got to keep your. You got to keep vigilance on it, a traditional mouse trick. Uh, there are, there's mouse bait that you can put out. It comes in either pellet form or block form. You put that around the car and uh, hopefully the mice will find it instead of your car and they'll, they'll chomp on that and uh, then they'll, they'll die, hopefully not in the car, uh, but uh, you can do that. Uh, some people like mothballs. I'm not a fan of that because once you put mothballs everywhere in the car, when you get it out in the spring, that's what your car smells like is a mothball car. And you go to a car show and you walk up to one and you go, oh, yeah, he used mothballs, you know, and you think to yourself, this is a dumb idea. I don't want mothballs in your car, really, really stinky. Uh, I have used uh, this product. It's called Fresh Cab. It's uh, a mixture of uh, some, uh, what do they call it, botanical rodent repellent. Uh, you open up the package that activates, it's in a little bag that, that kind of breathes. 
and uh, it smells pretty good. So I, I put this a couple of these bags in the interior of uh, my cars that I store, and uh, it's got a pleasant smell to it. It's not like the mothballs where it makes you want to think, oh, is that dumb? This stuff smells okay. And I, I've not had any issues with, with mice infestation. But you've got to uh, you got to make sure your, your garage is reasonably sealed. Mice will get in through any tiny hole. I mean, you're not going to mouse proof your car and the garage uh, 100%. So you got to do things to try and keep them out. So one thing is on the car itself, turn all the heater controls all the way up so that you close the vents in the system, close your fresh fast or into the interior. So you wanna try and close off everything as best you can uh, to keep them out. Uh, tailpipe, get some steel wool, you know, cheap enough, get some steel wool and put it in the tailpipe or tailpipes, whatever you have on your car to block the tailpipe. Uh, steel wool, uh, they don't like that. It's, it's not tasty, so they won't try and eat the steel wool. Uh, but pack it in there, not so tight you can't get it out it come time, but uh, it's it's a good idea to do that. I had a car of mine recently that was stored for about six years, had a new exhaust system on it. It wasn't a Corvair, it was something else, but it had the muffler all the way at the very end of the car. And uh, when I went and started that car up, after it had been in storage, I started up and it was noisy. I thought, the hell's wrong with this thing? You know, I, I finally got the car out and I moved it around. I got it in the shop and look, and my new muffler that was new six years ago, the bottom of it was disintegrated. It just completely rusted out. The, the mice, you know, had a hell of a party in that muffler and uh, they peed in there for six years and it completely rusted out that brand new muffler. And so why do we put steel wool in the tailpipe? There's your answer. I did have a Corvair one time that had been in storage a long time, supposedly ran. I did get it to start up. And after I ran it about five minutes, it started to make an odd smell. What was that? I have, I, I've smelled that before. It's familiar. It was old 102 and I was revving it up. And much to my alarm, popcorn started to fly out the tailpipe. Yeah. The mice had put a whole bunch of popcorn they found somewhere inside the muffler. And when it got warm enough, hey, popcorn machine, pop -o -matic. So, you know, the mice can be very inventive and uh, plug up that exhaust system or ruin the exhaust system. Uh, hey, so, hey, Larry, we have, a yeah. quest, we have one question asking if you could repeat the name of the mouse deterrent, that little package that you had. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's called Fresh Cab. Fresh cab, and you can look that up on on uh, the internet, and uh, I'm sure Amazon and stuff has. It was not hard to get. Fresh cab comes up. I think there's four of these packages in a box, and uh, you know this is good for one season. You know this doesn't it does, doesn't last forever. You put it in for one season, and that's it. That's all it's good for. But it uh, it, it is good. You know I've liked it. Uh, the other thing is that. Uh, you just want to make sure there's nothing else in the car that's going to get damaged. I would take out everything in the glove box that's paper. Uh, I've had a number of cars come in where the mice have had their way with the car and the once formerly nice owner's manual and other stuff disintegrated, ripped to shreds. Take that stuff out of the car before it sits so it's not going to be damaged. You know, in the map pockets, you got, if you got map pockets in the car, any paper stuff get it out of the car. So that's a, an important factor. There's other things that, that people have done to help prevent mice from coming in the car. And uh, because you wanna keep them, you know, seal up the car as best you can. Uh, we've all seen Corvairs with mouse house under the engine upper shroud. For some reason, they love to build a mouse house under the Corvair upper shroud. I took a lake would apart one time that the seats were empty. They had the covers, but there was no stuffing because all of it was in the engine upper shroud. When I removed the engine upper shroud, it had the perfect shape 
of the upper shroud. It was that jam packed. And of course, all throughout the entire heating system was just jammed full of that stuff. So, you know, the mice were already in there. They do a huge amount of damage. They'll also get the, the stuffing of the seats up inside the headliner in the roof and the pillars and everything. And, you know, if you get a car with that kind of damage, the best thing you can do for that interior is take it out and put it in the backyard and set it on fire. And because you're going to need a new interior, you will never get rid of the smell that that, that kind of infestation has caused. So you want to try and keep them out of the garage too. Obviously, you know, obviously seal up doors and stuff best you can. There are some uh, deterrents that you can use. Some of them, some of them work, some of them don't. There's these things, they're electronic, uh, you know, mouse uh, deterrents. I'm gonna plug one in for you. You might be able to hear it. It just makes a clicking sound when the little light goes off and it, it clicks. So I want you to aim that over there so they can see that a little better. It's just plugged in, it's like a little, little module, and you might be able to hear that just clicking. It's like a real slow turn signal flasher. Eh, that's all it does. So it's it's pretty, uh, it's not troublesome. It doesn't bother you. It takes almost no current. So in my garages, I've got these plugged into a bunch of the outlets. They're really inexpensive. I think I got them at Harbor Freight. Uh, there's other ones that you can get. You know, there's plenty, there's plenty, all kinds of mouse repellent stuff, but that's one way of doing it electronically. I read another, I actually heard it on a radio show, one item that I thought was pretty clever. And that was one that's real easy because everybody has one of these laying around. A radio. The mice don't like the noise. So get a radio. Everybody's got one laying around they don't use. Put it in the garage where your cars are parked and turn it on. Now, they didn't say whether the mice didn't like AM or FM or classic or jazz or talk radio. I don't think it matters. Just so it makes noise and that keeps, the, the mice aren't happy with noise. And get a radio, turn it on and just walk away from it. Leave that thing on. Not so loud that, you know, it's keeping you awake at night, but uh, put the radio on so that it's making noise inside wherever your car is at. And that may deter the mice from coming in in the first place. That's the important thing is to make sure they're, they're not there in the first place. Hey Larry, trick, yeah, hey, right? Larry uh, just a follow-up yeah. question on that mouse repellent. Mice yeah. is a popular topic. Um, oh, yeah. What, <laughs> where do you put the mouse repellent? Those little packages, do you have a recommended place to put them in? I, the just, put, I just kind of set them on the interior and the floor. You know, I set like one in every floor position where your feet would be. So the, the one box is four packets. I set passenger floor, front rear, you know, driver's side, front rear. So I, I don't really tuck them up in the real far corners or anything. I just put them on the floor because they're going to start out on the floor and, and go from there. Uh, and just the smell, you know, the four packets has a strong enough smell inside the car that, uh, you know, it'll, it'll permeate the whole interior area. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not foolproof. I mean, if you've already got mice inside the garage, I mean, eventually they're going to, you've got enough mice in there and they're going to find their way all over the car and in it. Uh, there's just no stopping them, but you try and make it as unwelcoming as you can, and uh, hopefully that'll uh, that'll keep you okay. One thing I did uh, uh, see a tip on it was actually by somebody in Old Cars Weekly, I've been a subscriber forever. Uh, they had a great idea, and that was to take a, an ordinary tissue and. Uh, Put that tissue on the floor of the car, just set it down like that. And do another one. And set it on the floor where your car is at, somewhere, somewhere where the wind is not going to blow it away. Okay, so maybe you want to put it under a little bit and occasionally check on that tissue. If you come into your garage one day 
and that tissue isn't there, where did it go? The mice have it. They're there. Okay, they're already there. So you know you got to take some action. Get those mouse traps out. Start start uh, aggressively trying to find where they're at. Put lots of you know mouse traps out and try and catch them. Uh, so that's one good way to tell if they're there or not. Because this this is the kind of stuff they love to to take and try and build their nest with. And that one in the car, if you have you know maybe you've got a car cover on, occasionally pull the car cover up a little bit and look on the floor where you set that, uh, that tissue. If that tissue isn't there anymore, or if it's in pieces, they're already there, man. You, you gotta do something now. So that's a, that's a good indicator to see if you've got a problem. Uh, you know, If you still see that tissue under your car after several months, and it's just like we set it there, it's a, well, you did a pretty good job of, of uh, keeping them out of your garage. Uh, and it's, I, I can't stress the importance of keeping the mice up. You can have thousands of dollars of damage, uh, you know, from just parking the car for six months. If the mice are in there, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be terrible. So uh, important to keep them up. Let's see, what else do we want to talk about? If you've got uh, a building, that maybe it's not heated and uh, the concrete sweats at different times of the year, uh, it's a good idea to lay down some plastic on the floor before you park your car on it. You can go to any of the big box stores and get a painter's drop cloth, a plastic drop cloth. They're, they're super cheap, a 10 by 20 is like three bucks. Lay that on the floor and drive the car over it because you don't want that moisture uh, coming up out of the concrete and then what's right six inches above it, the bottom of your car. So uh, put it over plastic or tarp, that'll work too, uh, to keep that moisture out. If you're in a situation where you've got that kind of environment where you could get uh, the concrete sweaty. So uh, make sure that you put the plastic down or tarp, it's cheap and it's gonna be real easy. So do that. Uh, if you've got a place that gets a fair amount of humidity in it, maybe you're by the coast or something, and you're you know you get a lot of humidity there. Well, you're going to have to ante up and get yourself a dehumidifier. You know, so you're going to run a little electricity expense there. Turn it turn it down so you know it's not running constantly, but you want to try and keep that uh, space as dry as you can. Uh, but if you've got a humidifier, you've got to be able to have it drain somewhere, okay? So if there's no drain where you're at, that means you're going to have to come by and, and visit your car fairly frequently to drain out that humidifier. If there's a drain in the floor, put the hose on it to the drain, and, and then you can pretty much leave it alone. But, uh, you know, keeping the car dry, that's important, especially in the underneath areas, because that's where it's going to get the most amount of moisture. One thing I do uh, with my cars is I, I've got an old uh, oscillating fan. I don't know, I think I got it at the Goodwill or store or something. And I've got it on a timer and that timer is set to run one hour a day. And I put on that oscillating fan, I got it plugged in at same kind of at floor level. And uh, I only have it on when the, I've actually got it connected up to a uh, uh, humidistat as well. So when the humidity gets a little bit higher, uh, and the temperature gets high enough. When, when you have low temperature, you have very little humidity. Okay. So when the temperature gets up uh, to 40 or so, then my fan turns on and it just oscillates. It blows air around for, uh, you know, an hour or so a day. And that keeps it from concentrating in one place. You know, the room may be a little bit humid, but we don't have it all clinging in droplets to the bottom of the car. So uh, the fan and the dehumidifier. You know, if you're going to be serious about this, if you got a nice car, you want to keep it nice. So it's going to take a little effort, and you know, you might spend a little electricity to do it, but that's just what it takes. And that's it for, except for a car cover. A car cover is always a good thing. At the minimum, I would say uh, get another one of those inexpensive drop cloths. Costs you almost nothing. 
just lay it over the car. You might have to cut a little hole for the antenna. And that will keep the dust off. You know, almost anywhere you put it. I know in my garage, my car garage, you know, I'm not doing any work in there, but Jesus, everything gets dusty in there. So put the, you know, the inexpensive drop cloth on there. You can get a real car cover, a custom fit one. And somebody wrote in a question, where can I get one for my Greenbrier? Well, go in the Clark's catalog in the car cover section, and they have one for every model. They got one for the ramp side. They got one for the core vans and Greenbriers. They got them for all the cars. They have several different materials. You know, there's a, huge variations in uh, car covers. There's lots of universal ones out there. Universal, you know, it means fits nothing really well. And you can uh, put a universal one on there. It'll do its job. It'll keep the car, you know, keep it from getting dusty. Uh, so with a $3 drop cloth. So, uh, you know, covering the car is a good thing. Now, if it's in your home garage and maybe you got some kids, uh, maybe you got another car that needs to park next to it, that presents a new problem. And that's uh, accidental things falling against the car, like bicycles coming in and out of the garage, uh, the lawnmower coming in and out, the uh, other car, somebody opens the door a little too far, boink, into the corner. rear. What you should do, <clears throat> again, uh, you know, uh, before you throw out those old comforters and things you uh, really don't want anymore, or you go down to the Goodwill store, pick up a nice comforter and lay, you know, put your regular car cover in place and then lay the comforter over the side of the car that is going to be exposed to the hazard. For instance, I have one over here. Be right back. I have to go to the parts department here. And we get this fine comforter that who knows where it came from. It was inexpensive, uh, but something like this, if we had our car sitting there, I would unfold this thing so that the one side of my car that was gonna be exposed to the hazard could probably take a bicycle leaning up against it without hurting the car. It could take a door of another car as long as it wasn't flung into it. It would take the damage by, by putting something soft over that side of the car. Uh, you know, stuff like that happens. I mean, uh, you know, you've all come out after the car's been stored and you go wash the car for the first time and you look, oh, where did this come from? It was perfect before. Well, you know, what are you going to do? It happened already. There's no, you can't undo it. But if you uh, cover up the side that's exposed to the, the uh, potential area of problem, then uh, you want to uh, try and minimize that. So those are the things I would normally do for a car that has been, you're planning to get it out in a short period of time, okay? Now there will be times when you're, you know for a fact that you're gonna have to lay this car for a while, okay? Uh, you got a job change, you're going out of the country, uh, that's happened to people I know. Uh, any number of things could cost it. Oh, I'm saving that for my son so he can get it as his first car. Well, yeah, he's only seven right now, but I'm going to store it for him. Okay, no, people do that. Uh, you're going to have to do more work. You're definitely going to want to jack the car up, get the weight of the uh, car off the springs. I would probably get some sort of compound like uh, Cosmoline or something like that. It'll spray uh, there's a number of products like this with a spray nozzle, you know, a little nylon tube in it. And with the suspension extended, I would try and spray this up to coat the shock absorber rods because when they're left exposed for a long period of time, they are going to get some rust on them. So I would use something like this on the uh, uh, shock absorber rods. Uh, Forget about the tires, don't worry about them. They're gonna be junk by the time you get to use them. Take the battery and put it in something else. You're not gonna take the battery out of the car, don't leave it in there, but use it in another car because it's gonna be no good by the time you, you get back to it in long-term storage. Be sure you run all the fuel out of it. So after you drain the gas tank, start the car up, let it idle till it quits. We wanna get the fuel as much as we can out of the lines, out of the pump, and use up as much as we can inside the carburetors because we, we know that 
that's all going to turn into nasty stuff. So we want to try and get all that out that we can. And uh, what else do we want to do for, for uh, extreme long-term storage? Hey, Larry, you, you, you talked about um, running the gas, running it dry. Yeah. Uh, a question came in, and I think it was probably around a little bit shorter-term storage. Um, do you run it dry for shorter term storage and do you put in stable in the gas remaining in the tank, some kind of stabilizer? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good to put in stable. Now, now keep in mind that you should be putting in the stable before you pull it in the garage to store it. You want the stable to be able to mix with the fuel. After the car's sitting there and you just dump some stable down the filler neck, it's not really going to mix with all that fuel very well if it's all sitting still, you know, so that the last day that you're going to be driving the car, put the stable in so that the stable mixes with the fuel. It's in the fuel that's in the lines. It's in the fuel pump, you know, so it's in the system uh, instead of just dumping it in after the fact. And uh, let me get a bottle of stable here. It's an important thing to remember. Now I've got the, Stable 360 here, and I've got Stable 360 Marine. They're very similar. The, the one for the Marine uh, is a little more uh, aimed towards ethanol type gas, uh, but they both say they're, they're safe for ethanol type thing. One thing that you should keep in mind, you know, you're, it tells you how much to put in. Did you ever read the fine print on this? In every one of these stable things, it says stabilizes fuel up to 12 months. That's it. It's supposed to stabilize the fuel for up to 12 months. So if you've got gas that's already a year old and you're going to say, well, I'll put some stable in, it'll be a bit better. Well, the gas is already old. It, you know, the stable is not going to, it doesn't regenerate the gas that's in there. You know, you got to start with the fresh gas to uh, uh, have the stable uh, help preserve it. If you, it's already old, it's already old. You can't take it back. So, uh, so stable is a good thing. Uh, you know, on, on my cars, when I go for short term, uh, I, I take the fuel out of the tank and, uh, uh, you can start it up and just let it idle until it uses up what's in the lines in the system. And that way you don't have a, a problem if it turns out to be a little bit longer than you thought it was going to be. Like I say, you know, my crystal ball doesn't work for crap, you know, and I don't know anybody else who's works really good. So can we absolutely guarantee that we're going to drive this thing in six months? You can't do it. You, you don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. So uh, prepare it, plan for six months, but prepare it like it's going to be six years. So that's, that's, that's a good philosophy to take. So yeah, go ahead and run the fuel out of it. Cause that's, I mean, guaranteed, you, you know, the usual four suspects, that's what I call them. Battery, tires, brakes, fuel system. Not much you can do about the brakes. I mean, if your car is accessible, you can get in there anytime you come by, once a month maybe, step on the brake pedal a couple of times, exercise the wheel cylinders, you know, make them move around a little bit. Uh, that will help. And uh, tires, nothing you can do about it. Uh, fuel, nothing you can do about it, other than the stable to help preserve it. the battery put a maintainer on, but you know, they get to a certain time period and they're not really serviceable anymore. So, uh, you know, hopefully everything works out like you think. And then in May you start up the car and it runs like new, so. So Larry, there is a question that came in on the chat about battery maintainers. Um, yeah. The gentleman wrote that he has an aftermarket radio in a 65 with the fuse 16 gauge wire connecting the disconnected battery cable to the battery post yep. and a maintainer connected to the post. Should I not be using that radio maintainer wire? Should he still be well, using the radio the, maintainer? The, the, the radio maintainer wire is the one that uh, has the memory for the radio. So it remembers what time it is, what stations you preset, all that stuff. That's what the power drain is going to be. That's your residual uh, you know, drain on the battery. Very small current, but leave it on there long enough and it will kill the battery. So like I said before, what you really should do is just simply disconnect one of the battery terminals. I don't care which one, positive, it doesn't matter. Disconnect it so nothing is connected 
in the car to the battery. Yeah, you're going to lose the memory on the radio. Hey, you might choose some new radio stations next time you turn it on. You never know. So, uh, you know, disconnect the battery so you don't have any power going through the car itself because uh, you don't want any shorts to melt everything down. And put the battery maintainer, you know, your charger maintainer just on two terminals to keep the battery up. So I hope that answered the question. But that's one of the, the big problems is, you know, the, the memory radios. And if you have a newer car, really anything built uh, from pretty much the, uh, oh, I guess uh, early 80s up, everything's got computers, they got digital this and electric that and everything. Huge drain. If you take a new car and you don't use it for a month, you're only gone for a month, you go back in, your battery has a certain condition known as FFD. You figure it out. That's freaking flat dead uh, because all that stuff drains the battery. Yeah, they have a mode where they go to sleep, you know, after a certain amount of time, but they, your battery's dead after a month. So, and you do that too many times, you, you kill your battery flat dead like that, you know, five, six times, you're going to be shopping for a new battery pretty quick. So. There was there was a question, but someone uh, answered. But I'll ask your your opinion: convertible top up or down for the winter? Oh, tough! Thank you. Top up, put the top up first thing. <laughs> you want to put a neon sign on the car that says "Mice, come on in, <laughs> leave the top down." <laughs> That's going to be great. The other thing is that when the top is down, of course, it's it's just kind of being loosely folded kind of like your t-shirt in the t-shirt drawer and when you pull it out it's got all these creases and it's not quite straight anymore what's well, the same thing with the convertible top if it's been down like forever you know a whole season when you go to put it up you can have a lot of wrinkles in it and when you try and put it up you're going to find it's about that far away from being able to clamp it at the windshield header because now it needs to stretch out well, so you got to put the car out on a nice hot sunny day where it's nice and warm. So things get a little loose and you can close it. I, I would never want to store a car with a convertible at the top uh, down because you're going to have problems come springtime when you go to put it up. It's uh, just not a good idea. Besides the obvious of the dust and dirt they'll get in the car and the uh, open invitation for any, any kind of animal, cats, I've had cars with cat prints on them and everything else. You, you don't want the top. Should, should it be latched? Because uh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I think right. so. Yeah. Okay, because that, that's the normal way the car is going to sit like this one is right now. The the top is fully latched on the car while it's sitting here, and uh, it's all nice and straight like it should be. And if I had left it released for a long period of time, uh, you know, unless we have a nice super hot sunny day where I've had the top out there baking. Uh, where it becomes more flexible, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a chore uh, latching it. So. Well, we've had uh, some good chat comments out here, things that people have used for their rodent control, things like glue traps. And uh, uh, someone commented that they uh, bought a California car cover inflatable car bubble. bubble. Oh, yeah, sure. Those are yeah, good yeah, mouse yeah. deterrent. Those, those are good. I've, I've seen people using those too. So yeah. uh, that rodent there, control. There's, there's lots of choices. Yeah. There's lots of choices for rodent control because it's such a widespread problem. I mean, anytime you got anything, I mean, they're everywhere, you know, and they're not just cars. They go in everywhere. So there, it's a big problem and there's lots of solutions out there. So don't take my suggestions as the only thing that'll work. There's lots of stuff out there that works for you. But uh, some of the least expensive things are the, the common mouse traps and uh, turning up the radio. That, <laughs> that, that may help too. So. And lastly, um, someone just asked, um, do we park it with the wheels blocked and park brake off? I, I like to, I don't leave my parking brake on when I have the cars in storage. I, you know, if it's a stick shift car, I leave it in gear. And, uh, you know, unless your garage is, is tilted, uh, you know, it's, it's not a problem, even on a power glide car, just to leave the brake off. Uh, you know, my, my kids have learned, and I, on a Corvair, because it doesn't have park, the Corvair parking brake is very powerful, and it gets used a lot. Regular cars with an automatic transmission, they just got park in them. And uh, 
hardly anybody uses a parking brake on an automatic car. So those get rusty. And uh, in fact, when my daughter took her driver's test, the, she parked the car and the, the instructor said she, he wanted to ding her because she didn't put on the parking brake. It's just my dad says never to put on the parking brake on an old car because once you put it on, it'll never come off. So he grumbled and said it passed. So, <laughs> Listen but to uh, that. yeah, I, I, I don't I don't like to leave them on uh, over the winter. Uh, I mean, if you if it's stuck, then the parking brake cable, the rear parking brake cable, the one that goes to the left wheel and right wheel, that one's stuck and has to be replaced. Okay, so that's that's where they get stuck at is the that rear parking brake cable. So you're going to have to do it eventually anyway, but you know, it's an inconvenience when you go to pull the car out of the garage and and you try and move it and it won't go. You know, so I you can deal with it when it's outside. Uh, so just my okay. opinion. This is great. Um, and really good questions, good chat out there. Looks like um, everybody's been interested in this. Um, I, I, again, the road control is always a topic that everybody gets well, it's, involved it's, it's in. It's a big problem. This is a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I just want to remind everyone that Larry did bring up in the beginning, we've had several people who joined a little bit later after he mentioned this, but um, he has uh, created a, a video to explain about starting up a car that's been sitting for a long time. So it's in the process of being editing, ed edited, and we will get that out on the YouTube channel and also um, let you guys know it's out there um, through the news you can use, email that comes out each month from the Corsa Club office. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you would get notified when new videos are posted to that channel. Oh, um, someone just asked, can you show the battery minder again, the one that you like to use, the one you like? Well, yeah, sure. There's a couple of them that I like. One of them, let's see, I've got so many on the table here. Let's find them. Uh, this is the least expensive one that I have found. Uh, this is the least expensive one that I found to be a, a nice one. It's got two LEDs, a red one, which shows that it's got AC power. It's plugged into the wall. And then a green LED, which indicates that it's actually charging. Okay. It will never light up the green LED if it's not making contact to the battery. And it will never light up the red LED if it's not got power at the wall. So this one is, is an inexpensive charger. Uh, it doesn't have a name on it. I'm not sure exactly where I got it, but you know, it's a pretty, uh, pretty simple thing. And I'm sure you'll find it on eBay uh, or similar Amazon, whatever. And so this one is an inexpensive one, but it doesn't give the uh, false indication that the the super low priced Harbor Freight one does, but just one LED. And like I say, the problem with the, the Harbor Freight one is that it will work when either it's plugged in the wall or the battery, this LED will light up and gives you a false sense that, oh, it's working. Well, no, it's not. It's taking power from the battery and not charging up anything. So if you've got one of these, they do work. If you test it to make sure the voltage is good, like this one was too high, the other one was too low, be careful on that and make sure they're plugged in properly. So it's, it's you know, the little money you saved by buying this as opposed to the other one, I don't know that it's a, a good choice. Uh, but that one with the double LEDs is, is okay for an inexpensive one. Uh, this one is really the, the the best one, I did get this one off of uh, uh, eBay. This one is made by Extreme Maxed Products. And this one has uh, got a digital display uh, that comes on. It, uh, it doesn't, as soon as you unplug the uh, power cord, uh, the LED display goes out. It doesn't, it doesn't take any power uh, you know, from the battery. And it, it, it also works on six volt and motorcycles too. So it's got different charging rates for the different uh, batteries and whatnot. So uh, this, is a, this is a nice one that's pretty compact. And uh, you know, the cords are long on it. They're good heavy duty, nice clamps and everything. So it's a good one that's not a whole bunch of money. Uh, there's all kinds of other battery maintainers 
uh, you will find a plethora of different kinds. Some are very elaborate. And uh, I don't know, some of them cost as much as a battery, you know, so I, I don't know that that's a, I suppose that you're gonna keep the, the uh, expensive one forever and uh, the batteries will come and go. But uh, as, a, as a, it's a, a nice one that uh, I like, I like them both. So if that answers it. I think it does. All right, um, we had uh, lots of folks on tonight. Lots of folks hung in there with us. I think everybody's ready. Yeah, we now. ran. We ran a little bit late. That seems to be a pattern I've got here. <laughs> because it's so interesting. Um, so I think everybody's ready now to kind of put their cars away. If you are in an area of the country where you don't drive them primarily because you don't want the salt from the road on right. your cars. Um, listen, we lived in Illinois. We drove our cars in winter as long as there wasn't salt on the road. Right. So uh, I think you know, we can drive them year round. But um, thank you everybody for joining. And Larry, once again, thank you so much. Very informative and uh, getting all your uh, show and tell items here. And I wanna also thank Shelly uh, Claypool who is our um, uh, uh, camera operator here. Uh, yes, she, uh, she hope she did a great job. Paid well there in her <laughs> union duties there. So uh, again, thank you guys so much. Mm -hmm.